Thursday. And uh, as I announced last week, I am uh, going to be hosting a weekly webinar series called Money Matters. And uh, today is day one. And uh, today's session is uh, on the topic of financial planning basics for individuals and families. And I figured that would be a good place to start. Okay. Yeah, I figured that would be a good place to start, guys. And uh, without further ado, I do have some slides I prepared for you today, which I will attempt to share. Hopefully, all goes well. Okay. Okay. Hopefully, you guys can see my slides. And. Uh, this is actually a presentation that my brokerage put together and I definitely made some changes to uh, update it and make it more relevant for, for today's times, guys. And uh, here's what we'll cover today. A bit about me, what is the current climate, why talk about this. We're gonna talk about some financial planning principles. And including in that, we're gonna talk about some financial defenses and some financial offenses. And we're going to cover possible topics for future webinars, and I would certainly appreciate your inputs in that regard. So a bit about me, guys. I am a licensed life and health insurance advisor in Ontario for the past over 10 years. Uh, most of that time has been spent at a uh, large national brokerage called Hub Financial. Some of you may have heard about Hub, some may have not. We represent the entire marketplace of insurance companies from Sun Life, Manu Life, Canada Life, um, you name it, down to some of the smaller companies. And I've also had some experience with residential real estate investing, including renovations, tenant management, and I'm currently pursuing a few professional designations, such as my certified financial planner, trust and estates practitioner, and certified executor advisor designations. I'm also a parent, and I know that may not mean a lot. However, I feel that because of that, I have a vested interest in the future of humanity and the future of the planet and even more so you know because i have a son i am thinking about his future and how to best prepare both myself and him for the best possible future and i am passionate about human empowerment on all levels and i feel that the financial field and financial empowerment can play a big role in that why are we even talking about this at this point in time, guys? We are currently going through a lot of uncertainty at the society level. Uh, we are in a time of a depressed economy, depressed financial markets, and legitimately people have concerns about our currencies being devaluated um, and what that will mean for the economy, for our financial futures. And one of the things that motivated me to start this series is that like with everything else in life, I'd like us to focus on what we can do versus what we cannot do. Uh, and of course, I cannot speak for you. I cannot tell you what to do. I just feel that in my own life, the more I focus on what I can do versus what I cannot do, I feel, I feel better about my life. I feel more in charge of my own future. And once again, I feel that's something that we could all use more of, some empowerment. And in light of everything we are facing as a, as a society, I feel there is currently an increased need for personal responsibility for our own well-being, uh, both physical, emotional, mental, and financial. And one of the things that comes to mind, you know, I, I'm aware that on the one hand, you know, because of certain government measures, our economy has been impacted. People are uh, dealing with financial dependency. We're seeing people uh, having forced to shut down their businesses and become dependents. Even in light of that, how can we actually be proactive and take control of our lives? Uh, another area where this has become apparent, the, the increased need for personal responsibility is the area of health. We know that here in Ontario, as well as pretty much anywhere in the Western world, so many uh, operations, uh, surgical procedures are being postponed. 
even the investigative uh, procedures are being postponed. So all of a sudden now, uh, we are forced as, as people to, to take responsibility for our own health and look for ways to attend to our health outside of the traditional medical system, which is currently not doing a good job serving the population. You may feel it that way or not. Um, we know that here in Ontario, something like 52,000 surgical procedures have been put off. Uh, 12,000 are being added on a weekly basis. So what can we do to potentially give ourselves access to quality health care despite our own governments not doing the job. Um, when it comes to finances, these are some of the statistics. These are from a few years ago, however, equally valid today. By the time uh, for Canadians starting their careers at age 25, these are the situations we are facing by the time uh, Canadians reach age 65. As you can see, a large portion of Canadians are still dependent on government support, uh, up to 47%. So I feel we all have to ask ourselves the question, which of those piles do we want to be in? And uh, I know where I would like to be. Uh, you know, I'm thinking most of us would like to get here. At the very least, we want to be in a place where we're able to maintain our standard of living and not have to face a decline in our standard of living as we get to that stage in life. What are some of the challenges people are facing when it comes to financial success? There are internal challenges such as our own habits. Uh, some of our habits don't serve us, um, you name it. Shopping therapy, I've been guilty of that at times. Um, not knowing how to prioritize spending. And then on an external level, there's a lot of noise. The media wants to keep us all always in a, in a state of panic and frenzy. Uh, the government, again, government measures change consistently. Uh, if there's one thing that's consistent about the government measures is that they're always changing. And unfortunately, for the most part, not to our benefit. So again, what can we do in light of all that to take charge of our lives, including on a financial level? Have you ever asked yourself, what is your greatest asset? When most people are asked, they would say things like my home, uh, perhaps my real estate portfolio. Our own potential earnings by the time we get to a certain age are usually our biggest asset. Now, of course, you can get to a stage where you do build significant wealth that you could say is running independently of you. However, just looking at most people, our income potential is actually our greatest asset. So to give you an example, somebody even with a 35K salary, by the time they get to uh, age 65, they will have earned you know, close to $2.4 million. And the higher that income, the higher the, the value of that, of that figure is. The question is how much of that will end up being allocated to the things that you care about, how much of that will you actually keep? We've all heard of the pay yourself first strategy and uh, it sounds great, right? We, we all aspire to, 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 to implement it and I'm sure some of us have. Um, however, if, if you've been in a situation where other things have been a priority and maybe you haven't had a chance to, to build towards that, it could be overwhelming to say, well, you should ideally be saving 10, 15, 20% of your income. We know that the wealthy in our society statistically save and invest more than 20% of their income. Um, the idea is we can all set incremental goals towards that. You don't have to do everything overnight. If, you, if you're starting from zero and all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, I should put aside 20% of my income that's coming in, that would not be realistic. So we could start with 2%, 3%, 5%, 10%, whatever it is that's realistic for you. And then the next question is, you know, where is that money gonna go? Um, this is a concept called the financial planning pyramid. When most people start thinking about financial planning and investing, a lot of the time people start in this top area here, which could sometimes be referred to as speculation. 
it's not been that long ago that we heard people putting their entire retirement portfolios in Nortel stock or BlackBerry stock, and we all know what happened there. So this could be said about other things. I, I know I have people in my network who are full-time or, or very heavy real estate investors, which is great. Real estate investing has been one of the greatest ways to build wealth through the generations. And I'm definitely not discouraging people from, from pursuing these avenues to grow their wealth. However, just like in a soccer game where you have your offenses and you have your defenses, when it comes to our investments and our financial life, we could think of certain vehicles that are you know, our financial offenses, so all, all our investments, everything that moves us forward financially, you could look at as our financial offenses. And on the other hand, you have things that are your financial defenses. Now, in a, in a soccer game, if your team plays pure offense and you have zero defenses, what do you think is going to happen at the end of the day? If you don't have a goalie, you have no defenses, are you going to win that game? Doubtful, right? Vice versa, if you have super strong defenses, but you have zero offenses, are you going to win that game? Very doubtful if you're never going to score. So ideally, similar in our, in our financial life, we want to have a combination of both offenses and defenses. Okay. Now, what do we mean when we say financial defenses? And there are many things you can put in place. These are just some of the things that are available to us in Canada. So you might have heard of these documents, Will and Power of Attorney. Now, this session will not necessarily get into that. Um, I do plan on having a separate session with a lawyer in the future talking about this particular topic. We also have certain plans and tools in place, such as life insurance, disability insurance, critical illness insurance. These are financial vehicles that are available that you can put in place as your financial defenses. And the idea here is that if God forbid the unexpected were to happen, you are not left without a goalie. You are not left to rely on only your own resources to defend yourself and your loved ones and your business and everything else that you care about. Now, when it comes to building net worth, guys, we already touched about on some of the things. Stock investing could be one of the areas. Real estate investing, gold, cryptocurrency investing. There are many vehicles we could look at to build your net worth and, and have your financial resources. Um, in Canada, we have certain tax preferred vehicles such as RSPs, TFSAs, our ESPs. We will touch on those on, in future sessions. But there are multiple ways you could build uh, your financial offenses. Now, guys, to, in today's session, I will touch on a couple of the financial defenses that are available. And we're going to talk a little bit about wealth creation as well and some of the basic principles of that. Um, I'm not able to see my Facebook at the same time, guys, because I have my screen maximized. I will have a look at questions in the end in case I missed anything, okay? Thanks for your understanding. I'm still learning how to use all the tools and integrate them, okay? So ideally, if we're starting from scratch or even if you have been doing some planning of your own, we wanna start where we are. You know, again, as, as, as many of us have many aspirations about where we wanna go, but I think number one, we wanna take stock of where we're at. After that, you can think about, okay, uh, here's what I want to get. Ideally, I want to be in a position where maybe I have so much money in savings or I have a certain number of properties and I have a certain amount of cryptocurrency investing. It, we can all set certain goals. And what we mean by financial capacity, financial capacity is Let's be realistic. Somebody that's earning three grand a month versus somebody that's earning 10 grand a month is going to be in a different situation in terms of how much they can comfortably set aside both towards their financial offenses and their financial defenses. So that's what financial capacity refers to. And again, we talked about that percentage, how you could start with something, do something, anything, and move towards perhaps that 20% figure that we were talking about. Allocate appropriately. Again, this talks about you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. 
I know it's very tempting to do so, especially if you found a strategy that works for you. So again, we have people that are very successful real estate investors and they have built tremendous wealth that way. My concern there is again, what have you done to make sure that wealth is protected and that you're not gonna be in a situation where you're taken advantage of by the government um, and where all the wealth that you've built could potentially be threatened or, or end up being dissipated. So we can talk about that again in future sessions, guys. Um, ideally, you wanna review this, I would say at least on an annual basis. Now, you could do that by yourself with your own family, or you could do that together with a financial coach, a trustworthy individual. Um, and then ideally, in doing so and repeating this process on a, at least an annual basis, you will have that greater peace of mind. Financial, I don't even like the word financial security. I like to think of it as peace of mind. That feeling of being in control, feeling that you're moving forward in life. Okay, guys, so now um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the financial defenses available. Now, not everything we discuss may apply to you. Some of the stuff may apply to you. Take it as it is, and, and then you can decide whether or not some of these strategies could be useful in your own planning, okay? Um, talking about life insurance, why would you need life insurance, if at all? Um, how much insurance do you need, and what type is best for your needs? We gotta ask ourselves, why do we insure our valuable assets? Um, most of us, if not all of us, will have insurance on our home, on our car, some people would even insure their diamond ring. And why, would, why do we insure our valuables? Because obviously we value them and we wouldn't want to lose them, or if we do lose them, we wanna be able to replace them. Uh, we already discussed though that in the greater scheme of things, what is your most valuable asset? And, and, and better said, who is your most valuable asset? We talked about how, how much we are worth as people, financially speaking. So even on a 35K a year income, not to mention higher levels of income, this is how much you, you tend to make by the time, by retirement age, okay? Regardless of what industry you may be in. Now, again, some of us get to a point where some of your income is now coming from what we call passive income sources. Um, and then there's a different level of planning that, that comes with that. But for most people, their ability to earn an income continues to be their primary uh, source of income and source of financial abundance. So what, what is life insurance supposed to do? So when you're actively at work, you're able to uh, put some of your income towards investments, your financial offenses, as we spoke about. Your income is what's supporting your lifestyle. Unfortunately, if all of a sudden you're no longer there and you have people that are dependent on you financially, such as minor children uh, or any other loved ones that are financially under your wing, so to speak, this is where life insurance can come in. And even though emotionally you could never be replaced, at the very least financially, you could put a buffer in place so that your loved ones are protected. So how we arrive at how much insurance we need, usually it's a combination of, okay, well, what are your earnings like? What is your lifestyle like? Somebody who earns 30K a year versus 80K a year will have a different lifestyle uh, for the most part. And thus a different need for insurance. Somebody who has minor children versus somebody whose children are fully grown, independent, different stages in life warrant a different level of coverage. The other thing we look at oftentimes are, do you have a mortgage on your property? Uh, would you want to have that mortgage paid off if you're no longer there to be able to pay for it? Um, any other debts a person might have? Unfortunately, you know, especially in the case of uh, a married taxpayer, it, it, it really is, you know, whatever you own transfers over to the spouse, but also whatever you owe also transfers over to the spouse. Um, now, you guys may know there are three types of life insurance in the marketplace, uh, really two, but for illustration purposes, we can talk about what we call term insurance. Term insurance starts off being very inexpensive. Eventually, as we get older, premiums become higher and higher. Eventually, the policy expires. There are some policies, there's at least one company in the marketplace that will offer term insurance all the way to age 100. 
I don't see too many people um, keeping this sort of policy in force for that long because these premiums become quite unaffordable later on. Term insurance is ideal for when we're dealing with a temporary type need. For example, if you have minor children or you want to cover the mortgage on your primary or on your principal residence, those needs are temporary in nature and they can be inexpensively covered with term insurance. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have permanent policies. There is such, in this case, it's like a lease. So what this is, it's a pay-as-you-go type policy where um, your premiums remain the same based on your age and your health right now, and they continue at the same premium for the duration of the policy, which in this case, it would be pay-as-you-go to age 100. Now, there is a place in the marketplace for these types of policies. Um, but at the end of the day, you are responsible to pay a premium for life. In the realm of permanent policies, we also have, and you know what, this may be a bit confusing, but the idea is you can have a permanent policy where instead of having to pay a, a, a premium for life, you can choose to compress the premiums for 10, 15, 20 years, and that policy will still remain in force for life. And what you see here, cash value accumulation, some of these policies come with a built-in um, investment component that grows for you even beyond the time where you're no longer having to pay a premium and we could do a separate session on that because there are some interesting options and opportunities with those types of policies so um, this type of policy that has an investment component can be used not only for protection needs but it could it, it is actually seen as an alternative asset class um, it is a tax sheltered investment vehicle. It can be used as an alternative or as a supplement to an RRSP or a TFSA. There are many bells and whistles and many benefits that come with these types of policy. Okay. As we mentioned, as somebody goes through their life, as we go through our life, our needs change. So in the early years, when you're in that wealth accumulation stage, oftentimes we accumulate more debt than, than wealth initially. You know, you take on a mortgage or multiple mortgages. Um, we may have minor children. So these, this is actually, in most people's lives, this is the time where the need for insurance is highest. The need for life insurance is highest because our, our debts and our responsibility are also so high. Now, as you get later in life, provided you've been successful, you've acquired a certain amount of wealth, there is another need for insurance and that is for estate planning purposes. In Canada and many countries in the world, the wealthier you are, the more you're also worth to the tax man. So there comes a point, especially upon that wealth transfer, when you're now looking to transfer your wealth to the next generation, where unfortunately the tax man shows up with open arms and they want a share of your estate. And this is an area where life insurance can also be used to provide liquidity to the estate for, so that taxes can be taken care of and that your wealth, your real estate wealth, for example, or other investments that you may have do not get dissipated in taxes. Um, again, this is a topic for a future session, but the idea is the, the stage of life that you're at determines, number one, your need for coverage and also what type of policy we will usually be looking at. In the early stages, you're primarily talking about a large amount of term insurance. And then as we get older, you know, most people are going to have at the very least your need to cover uh, final expenses. And then to the extent that you have achieved financial success and wealth, you will likely have this estate preservation need as well. And here we're generally talking about permanent life insurance policies because unfortunately we cannot determine when that event happens. Okay. Um, I have a few slides prepared about disability insurance, guys. This again has to do with your financial defenses. Um, in Canada, if you're an employee, uh, oftentimes you're going to be covered under a group plan, which oftentimes will include disability insurance coverage. What disability insurance is meant to do, guys, is if you're not able to work for whatever health-related reason, whether it was an accident or an illness of some kind, Disability insurance is meant to replace a certain portion of your income. By law, the government says, well, we'll only let you collect 
67% of your pre-disability income. The idea is there has to be some incentive to go back to work. If you're sitting at home collecting as much on disability as when you were working full time, um, there wouldn't be any incentive for people to get back to work. So I have just a few slides about disability insurance. Um, Okay, why do you need it? Uh, okay, there are a few different types of policies in the marketplace, guys. At the very basic level, we have policies that cover you for accidents only. Now, as uh, we will see, only a small percentage of disabilities are actually uh, due to an accident or what we call a blunt force injury. Um, most people, when most people think of disability, they think, oh, uh, maybe somebody fell off a ladder or maybe it was a car accident. In reality, as you'll see, only about 10% of disabilities are as a result of uh, an injury. The majority of, of uh, disabilities are actually due to uh, a sickness of some kind, um, mental health, back problems, cancer, heart attacks, you name it. Um, but by and large, we're dealing with an illness of some kind. And the chances of being disabled by before age 65, so if we were to look at the entire marketplace and different types of industries and so on. Overall, there's a one in three chance that somebody could face a disability before age 65. The average length of a disability longer than 90 days, so a disability longer than 90 days, the average length of a disability longer than 90 days ends up being 2.9 years. So if you're wondering, you know, why, why, why are we even talking about disability insurance? Well, we already spoke about how um, your income is your most valuable asset. And the question is, could you afford to take 2.9 years off work because all of a sudden you have to focus on your health? Again, if you are a salaried employee somewhere, you may already have disability insurance through your work, in which case you don't need to worry about getting your own policy. However, those of us who are self-employed, whether um, a sole proprietor or through a corporation, are usually left uncovered for, for this one in three risk, okay? If you became disabled, how could you, you know, could you afford to pay your mortgage or rent, buy food, pay for your utilities, make car payments, make other loan payments? Now, one thing to keep in mind, guys, that when it comes to disability insurance, it does cover somebody's active income, um, also known as insurable earnings. So to the extent that your income is now coming from passive sources, such as rent, that would not be considered insurable earnings for disability insurance purposes. However, if you are, let's say, a full-time flipper or wholesaler, um, that is considered insurable earnings because that is active business income. So to the extent that, and, and something else to keep in mind is to the extent that you pay yourself a salary, if you are paying yourself in the form of dividends, again, that is not usually seen as insurable earnings, um, but there are things we can do and alternatives that we can talk about in terms of still protecting your income, okay? Once again, we spoke about how you are your own most valuable asset, uh, both yourself and your loved ones, okay? Um, I like this slide, guys. It says, which job would you rather have? Job A, you're making, let's say, 90K a year, but if you're not able to work, you make zero money. Or job B, where you make one to 5% less than in job A, but if, you became disabled, you would be collecting 67% of your pre-disability income. Okay, one more uh, in terms of the financial defenses. And this is the last financial defense I'll talk about, and then we'll have a few slides about wealth accumulation, okay? So we spoke about disability insurance, guys. Disability insurance is an income type benefit meant to replace your income. It's not, good, or at least a portion of your income. It's not going to put any additional money in your pocket uh, in case you ever were facing a more serious health situation, okay? Um, disability insurance is really meant to help somebody still pay for their cost of living and keep living, keep maintaining, sustaining themselves and their loved ones. But again, what about unexpected or you could say expected expenses that can come up if a person is actually diagnosed with a more serious health condition? So let's talk about critical illness insurance and where that fits in as a financial defense. Um, why was it invented? What is the need? So this plan called critical illness insurance was actually invented by a South African 
heart surgeon, Dr. Bernard. Dr. Bernard uh, was one of the leading surgeons uh, when it came to heart surgery. And what he realized was that now that the medical world was advancing to a point where we could save people's lives uh, from conditions that in the past would have been lethal and led to immediate death. However, in saving people's lives, there was a recovery period. Most people are not able to go back to work the next day after a heart attack uh, or, God forbid, dealing with cancer. So once again, due to earlier diagnosis and better treatment, people were not passing away when diagnosed with a serious illness. So in other words, they were not making, I know this is a little uh, maybe funny, not so funny, good news, people were not using their life insurance policies. They didn't need to make a claim. However, their lives were still impacted financially, emotionally, and there was no relief available at the time in the insurance industry. Um, so what this gentleman uh, thought of was that there should be a plan out there whereby if somebody gets diagnosed with a major health condition, money would be paid for them to support them in their recovery efforts. Now, I mentioned, guys, you know, we are in a time where perhaps in the past, especially in a country like Canada, we would pride ourselves in having one of the leading health systems in the world, you know, and many things are covered by OHIP, uh, Ontario, in Ontario, Ontario Health Insurance Plan. Um, however, we also know that some things are not covered by OHIP. So for example, somebody diagnosed with cancer in Ontario, chemotherapy, radiation inside a hospital would be covered. Any alternative treatments, you're out of pocket for that. Any treatments out of country, perhaps you don't want to sit and wait on a on a waiting list in Canada until um, until your procedure can be performed. Unfortunately, we've seen this uh, cases of long wait times for critical procedures uh, or even diagnostics like MRI tests. Right now, MRI machines I understand are literally running 24/7. Again, I'm not sure how that has been affected by the recent events. But what, what I know for sure is that alternative treatments, holistic treatments, all of that is not covered by OHIP. And many of us, if given the choice, would perhaps choose something less invasive than surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. Just saying. Of course, you are always a choice. But really, here's where the question arises. If you do want to give yourself access to alternative treatments, will you have the resources to do so? because the wealthy have always had the means to you know, fly down to the US for faster treatment, go to the Mayo Clinic, what have you. Um, what, what about the rest of the world? What about the rest of us? So the idea with this plan was that if the person survives for 30 days, um, we, they, would be, they would receive a, a lump sum of money in the amount of their choice. So once again, critical illness insurance, as opposed to disability insurance, which is a monthly income benefit, critical illness insurance is a lump sum of money that a person would receive if they ever diagnosed with any kind of major health condition. Some, most companies still have a 30 day requirement. In other words, you have to survive for 30 days. If you don't survive, the plans come with a return of premium on death benefit, which means that uh, any premiums you paid into the plan would be paid back to your estate. Some, plan, some companies out there, such as Desjardins, they've even removed the 30-day survival requirement. So literally, person had a heart attack today, tomorrow they could put through a claim for their critical illness policy. Pretty, pretty amazing. And then again, that gives a person choice in terms of the type of treatments they would want to give themselves access to. And it does provide some much needed financial relief in addition to what you may already be able to receive from a disability insurance policy. But again, um, we'll talk about, about that later. In other words, for someone to make a claim on a disability insurance policy, you have to prove that your ability to work has been impacted. Now, somebody could be diagnosed with cancer and perhaps still be able to work, in which case they would not even be able to make a claim on their disability policy. However, they may be able to make a claim on their critical illness insurance policy, which again, can give them options in terms of um, treatment, and gives them money when they need it the most. Again, the idea with this policy is that you would be covering costs that are not covered by OHIP. It can cover holistic treatments out of country, possible out of country treatments. 
it would allow somebody to focus on their recovery and uh, potentially take a holiday. Well, potentially, uh, depending on what stage of life the person is, they may say, you know what, I'm just not going to go back to work. I'm just going to focus on my health. And, and obviously, that, that should be everyone's number one priority when facing a major health condition. However, some people could be in a situation where for lack of resources, they have no choice but to do their best to work while they're still recovering their health. Um, unfortunately, I've had personal, not personal experience, but people close to me, such as my mom, a good friend of mine, dealing with um, cancer, unfortunately, and I've seen, I've seen those consequences. What are some of the things that are covered? The major conditions, guys, heart attacks, stroke, cancer. <sighs> like, look, I know many of you who are my Facebook friends and so on are very proactive about your health. And you may not feel that you are at a risk for any of these things. We know statistically, you know, the Canadian Cancer Society is telling us that one in two Canadians is going to get diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. Those are just current statistics. My concern is. I'm sure you, you know, as an educated person, you probably know that there are certain technologies and there are certain things currently being put in the atmosphere and around us that are unfortunately not under our control. So as proactive as we may be about our own health, uh, my concern is that we don't control everything. And to the extent that we don't control things, what can we do to protect ourselves and potentially give ourselves that higher level of control over, over our choices when it comes to our health care. Uh, yeah, these are some of the statistics. So unfortunately, crit critical illness and disability account for 48% of uh, mortgage foreclosure statistics. Um, it's one of the main reasons that uh, people face foreclosure in Canada. Okay. Yeah, once again, um, a person is a lot more likely to be diagnosed with a major illness and survive it than it is than they are to simply pass away instantaneously. So it, it is a very real risk. We're talking about one in two just for cancer alone, let alone all the other um, conditions that this policy covers for. Which insurable risk would have the biggest impact on your life? Um, getting your car stolen, getting your house broken into, a house fire, well, that would be pretty serious. Um, loss of jewelry or valuables or a cancer diagnosis. You can ask anybody that's been through that and they will, they will tell you what's, you know, probably most impactful in somebody's life. Um, risks for male and female, uh, males and females, they're actually quite similar. Um, and I see that just based on premiums. There's not a whole lot of uh, difference in premiums for critical illness for men and women, uh, for critical illness insurance. For disability insurance, we do see um, slightly higher premium for premiums for women. For life insurance, we see slightly, slightly higher premiums for men. Again, all has to do with statistics. Yeah. Uh, this simply says that uh, we've all heard of some of these celebrities. Uh, that have had to deal with major health conditions, all of them would have been able to make a claim on a critical illness policy. Some of them may have already had one, but I mean, in other words, almost nobody is immune. Uh, they are a lot more immune than the rest of us just because of their own financial resources. My, uh, my concern is also, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, you know what, I, uh, I have a successful business. I don't need this, I can self-insure. Those of us who are real estate investors know the power of leverage. Our own money is usually, if not always, the most expensive money there is. If you can use leverage, you can, you can pay, let's say, a small monthly premium to have access to a large amount of coverage. You're now offloading that risk from yourself to an insurance company. These are just some of the uh, consequences of someone facing a critical illness um, a critical illness. So how, how would that impact all these other aspects of life? Um, we all would still have our day-to-day -day expenses. And again, 
you know, the bills don't stop because you've stopped working or because now you have to focus on your health. Um, who do you know who has faced a critical illness? Were there emotional, physical, and financial issues? Would cash have helped? How? Uh, if you were diagnosed, what would be your immediate concern? In the ideal world, what would you want? And how much coverage would you want? Uh, for critical illness insurance, guys, there are two options in terms of the premiums. Just like for life insurance, you can either start with an inexpensive term policy, which does become more expensive in time, or you could look at a permanent solution where the premium becomes fixed and remains fixed all the way to age 75 or age 100. One interesting uh, feature of these plans, it's an option that you can add on, is, is something called return a premium on surrender. So let's say after a certain period of time, 15, 20 years, or potentially age 65, you, you, so you remained healthy. You, you purchased one of these policies, but you've stayed healthy. There is something called a return a premium on surrender option, whereby if you've remained healthy, you can actually get back all the premiums you put into the plan up until that point in time. Some people like that, especially those of us who, who are proactive about our health, and we think, you know what, I'm the last person that would get diagnosed with something because I take such good care of my health. Okay, well, you can put this option in place. That way, if something does happen to you, you get to collect, you would collect on the benefit of the policy. If nothing happens to you, you can surrender the policy, get your premiums back, and then worst case scenario, well, it's not the worst case scenario, but in the scenario where unfortunately you are in the in the minority of people who passes away from one of the health conditions or perhaps from another cause such as an accident, then you, you don't even have a chance to collect on the benefit your estate or your named beneficiary would get all the premiums that you put into the plan. So really, it's a win-win-win scenario putting in place this sort of financial protection for yourself. Uh, one other area where critical illness insurance can come into play is actually protecting your retirement savings, or I'd like to say your other assets. And here, I'd like to talk about how I know real estate investing is something many people are getting into. And from what I've seen, most people who are real estate investors concentrate the majority of their wealth in real estate investments, which again, I am a big fan of real estate investing. The only issue is that most real estate investments are not particularly liquid. We've been in a very fortunate market situation here in South, South Ontario, Southwestern Ontario, but um, we don't control what kind of market we're gonna be in, how quickly we may be able to liquidate assets, and the question is, would you even want to liquidate your real estate portfolio to come up with the liquidity to pay for potentially expensive holistic treatments or out-of-country treatment? Uh, somebody who has a traditional uh, investment portfolio, the question is, where would most Canadians go to to access cash in an emergency? Well, uh, one area where they would likely go is their RRSP. Now, somebody may say, well, maybe I'll put a line of credit on my property if that's an option. That's, that's also an option. But the worst thing, you, just about the worst thing you can do is cash in your RRSPs to take care, to come up with the liquidity. And that is because of taxation. So to give you an idea, to be able to withdraw 100K from your RRSPs, you would actually need to withdraw, in a 40% tax bracket, you would actually need to withdraw 166,000. And so not only you're now foregoing you're, you're sacrificing your own life savings. What about all the lost future growth that that portfolio would have had? So a criticalness policy can actually help um, can actually help protect your your retirement portfolios. It can help protect your other assets. And again, um, real estate investing is fantastic. It's just not particularly liquid. And this type of policy would provide liquidity when it's needed the most protecting you both personally and at the same time protecting your investments. Um, again, we talked about the different types of plans. You could go with an inexpensive term option, which does become more expensive later. Or, And again, this would have to do with what stage of life somebody is at and also affordability. The permanent policies do tend to be pricier, but at the same time, premium remains the same. You're not facing an ever-increasing premium. Uh, finally, guys, I will say a few things about wealth accumulation, okay? 
I know people who are in the real estate world will say, you know, when is the best time to buy real estate? Uh, yesterday. When is the next best time? Today. Another uh, saying is that it's not about timing the market, but it's about time in the market. The same can be said about uh, virtually all investments out there. And uh, here's just a prime example of that. So the, the younger somebody is when they start wealth accumulation, the, the more that compound interest effect will work in their favor. So as you can see, if you start at the age 25 investing a thousand per year with 6% compound interest, you will be far ahead of somebody who started later in life investing a higher amount at the same interest rate. It's just that time value of money, guys. Um, the other thing we want to do is obviously take advantage, sorry, take advantage of any uh, tax sheltered vehicles we have to our, um, in our repertoire. We can talk about that, uh, but taxes can definitely eat up uh, a significant amount of our of our assets if we're not careful and, and, and if we don't plan properly. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this, the uh, so-called index chart. It simply shows that despite the ups and downs in the market uh, throughout the years, overall there is an increase. The economy does grow in time. And uh, we've all heard about the saying, you know, buy, uh, what is it? Buy low, sell high. So the ideal is we, we want to buy when the market is uh, at the bottom and then we want to sell when uh, when it's at the peak. Unfortunately, uh, in most people's cases, we're seeing the opposite. It, it, it's too often the case that when we're seeing a decrease, a decline in the markets, people, for lack of a better word, freak out and they start liquidating, they go to cash. They, uh, they, uh, they exit the market at, at the worst possible time. So again, the idea is rather than trying to time the market, you could at the very least keep a portion of your savings. Now, again, if you want to do more exotic things with some of your investments, you certainly can. But overall, the, the idea is um, BCA dollar cost averaging. So consistency, 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 consistent smaller deposits as opposed to large deposits that you're trying to time when the market is great um, will have actually a, a, a higher net result in the end. I don't have a slide on that. But, but what the numbers show is that a person that consistently deposits into an investment program, whatever type of investment you are in, as opposed to trying to time the market and exiting often at the bottom and, and, and then buying at the peak, a person who is consistent will have a higher overall return than somebody who tries to time the market. And this could be said about many types of investments. So again, when it comes to real estate, I've heard it said many times, it's about time in the market as opposed to timing the market. Right now, uh, we, we are in a depressed market right now. So many people, um, unfortunately, many people get scared in those types of situations and they end up selling their market-based investments and going to cash. When in fact, it's times like these when the opportunity for most wealth can be created because essentially everything's on sale when, you know, from stock to, to properties, you, 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 you should be able to get a better deal today versus at the peak of the market two years ago, to give you an idea. Um, again, we can talk about um, diversifying your assets um, by asset class. And again, in future sessions, I'd like to get into different types of assets, uh, whether it's real estate, um, different types of financial assets, cryptocurrencies, precious metals. There's, there's a lot of interest. People are very much interested in diversifying uh, beyond just stock versus stocks versus bonds. Obviously, your risk tolerance will determine what type of portfolio, what type of investments you will have. Um, and finally, guys, this is just about uh, my last slide or second last slide. Here are some topics I'm considering for future sessions. Uh, if you are on Facebook and watching this, I would appreciate your feedback um, as to which topics would be of interest, of interest to you. Um, I'll leave this up for a little bit. And of course, I'm very open to your suggestions. If you have 
any sort of financial topic that is of interest to you that you'd like to see addressed in future sessions, um, I would definitely be happy to consider that and hopefully we can make it happen. And one thing I'd like to say guys is that I'm definitely not an expert on everything. And uh, my intention for these sessions is to, in future sessions, have other people that are specialists in their industries, whether it's a different type of, certain types of real estate investing, whether it's private lending, whether it's alternative investments, you name it. There are so many areas and I'm definitely not an expert on everything. So what I'd like is to have those people that are experts in those areas uh, share with us about, you know, how we could get started. Um, okay, so that brings me to our final slide here. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. If you have any questions, suggestions, or you'd like to find out how some of these concepts could apply to you personally, um, I invite you to reach out. That's my phone number and uh, I can be reached at info at mavenwealth.ca. Just so you know, my Maven Wealth website initially was created for uh, real estate investors. It needs a lot of work, okay? But I, I'm thinking in the same spirit of doing what I can versus what I can't, something is better than nothing. And uh, my email works and I will continue to keep doing what I can do, okay? Thanks everyone, again, for your attention. I will now look uh, in at the meeting controls because I don't even know what to do here. Stop share, stop share, okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, I'm gonna see if I can go to Facebook. Okay, somebody posted something. Oh, thank you very much, Liana. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Let me see if I can go back to uh, Facebook to see if there were any questions there. Uh, oh Lord, I don't think the, the uh, Facebook even worked to be honest, okay. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> I will post this, guys, on my uh, future YouTube channel, Maven Wealth, and I will announce all of that, okay? Thanks again, everybody, for your attention, and uh, I hope to see you soon on future sessions, okay? Thanks and uh, blessings. Bye for now.